And so I forgot to put my titles up there, affiliations, but uh, I'm actually uh, in the Department of Petroleum Engineering, uh, in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, and a member of the Institute for Computational Engineering Sciences at UT Austin. So I'm actually an engineer, and there are far too many equations in this talk for me to claim my engineering title today. But so I, I'm going to go ahead and start off with some pictures, right? Um, so paradynamics, it was talked about a little bit yesterday. Um, paradynamics was born at San Diego National Labs, uh, the idea of a guy named Stuart Silling, uh, and primarily born to solve these type of problems, pervasive failure, fracture problems. And so these are all applications. Uh, uh, these are simulations that I have run myself in, in my life as an engineer. So uh, in the top left corner there, there's like a concrete ball impacting a, a rigid surface, and you see the massive pervasive failure. So the different images are as time progresses. Uh, this is, uh, I used to do a lot of this type of work, penetration mechanics. So this is an earth penetrator um, entering a, a concrete target. Uh, there's some sort of ductile failure test sample. And then this is a, a brittle plate. It's kind of a famous picture you see in a lot of paradynamic simulations. So this is a brittle plate impacted by a rigid sphere. And you see these complex fracture patterns. And it's actually quite amazing when you see the results from paradynamics in some cases because the constitutive models, you know, the, the, the force versus displacement or the stress versus strain type models that are used in all of these simulations are very, very, very simple. They're not near complex enough to, you know, actually model observed mechanical deformation of materials. Um, so they, they tend to do really well when you have a, a linear elastic material like a glass that is, you know, has brittle, has a brittle failure phenomenon. Uh, but when you get into things like in the upper right hand corner where you have a significant amount of like plastic behavior. Uh, before failure, before crack propagation, then the material models that we have aren't complex enough. And so we've sort of been on a search for how to do uh, better constitutive modeling in paradynamics. Um, and there's a couple of approaches you can take. Some are easier than others, more straightforward than others. So there's the, the paradynamic momentum equation. And so you see there's no spatial derivatives in it. And the, the focus of this talk is going to be on, did that not show up? Well, my highlights aren't showing up. Anyway, lots of problems today. It's OK. So on the, what, what I was trying to do there is highlight the integrand of that, of that function. So I think this has a pointer, right? Yeah, so the focus of my talk is going to be what, you know, the, the integrand of this is really the constitutive response of the material. And the, the, the focus of this talk is going to be on developing new constitutive models, uh, a new class of constitutive models to, for the integrand there. Uh, but before doing that, I thought I would, you know, there's a lot of, I showed a picture of a paradynamic body here. And we typically have this sort of idea of a horizon and characterized by some length scale delta. Uh, but what I thought I would do to start off, because it'll help later, is actually derive this equation. And the way I like to do it is I like to use Hamilton's principle. Because for, if I use Hamilton's principle, I don't have to convince you of any notion of something like a non-local flux. I mean, we're all taught uh, as engineers what a flux is and you know, in school. And it always involves some sort of gradient, spatial gradient. And so it's a little bit strange to most engineers to, to this concept of a non-local flux. And you really have to have this concept or believe in this concept of non-local flux to derive it from a mechanical balance perspective. But when you derive it from an energy perspective, from Hamilton's principle, it's, it's unneeded. So Hamilton's principle states, you know, I won't reread it, but, or I guess I will just quickly, among immiscible notions in the body, the, the actual motion of the body is such that this is true. Right? And so this is your uh, kinetic and potential energies in some virtual work, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk at all about uh, the kinetic energy of the virtual work because those terms are trivial. They work out to exactly what they work out to be in the classical theory. And that's the inertial term and the body force term that appears in the equation of momentum. So really what I'm going to talk about is the potential energy term. 
So in a paradynamic body, we, we say that the, the potential energy, the total potential energy in the body is a function of the displacement at point x, right? This is where we're going to write the equation. And it's a function of every other point in the body. So x plus xc, where x, where xc is just a vector from x to every other point in the body. So this is the most general thing we can do. We're saying that the total potential energy in the body is a function of not only the displacement at x, but the displacement at everywhere in the body. And if you had no other sort of knowledge of experiments or anything, this is the only correct thing to do. Right? It's an approximation to say that the total potential energy is a function of the gradient of u. You have to have some experimental knowledge or some, you have to have, that's an approximation to say that. This is the only thing you can do without approximation. So to define the kinematics, you know, this is first day of continuum mechanics, right? So when I teach a class in continuum mechanics, I write these two potatoes. We have a reference configuration and we have a deformed configuration. And really, in, when we're talking about kinematics and, and, and uh, continuum mechanics, what we're interested in doing is basically tracking line segments from the undeformed to the deformed volume, right? And we do that by, you know, typically we'll track a vector. So in this case, our vector in the undeformed volume we call xc, and the, the vector in the deformed volume, I call this y. I'll give it a name later, but let's just call it y right now, okay? So my, my objective is to write y as a, f as a function of the displacements of x and x plus xc and xc. Right? So I want to write y, the deformed vector, in terms of the displacements and the reference coordinates. Well, the way we do it in classical continuum mechanics is we, we say that if this point here, x plus y, is close, or in other words, we do a Taylor series expansion about the point xc, the vector xc, equal to the zero vector. Right? And when you do that, you get this Taylor series expansion here, and so this is y in terms of the displacements and the reference vectors. Right? And of course, the way we usually write that would be something like that, so you notice that that leading term I plus grad U is the classic deformation gradient, right? So this is the fundamental notion of deformation in classical continuum mechanics. And so all I'm going to do now is just change my notation. So everywhere you see an XC, I'm going to replace it with a DX, and everywhere you see a Y, I'm going to replace it with a D little X. And you get back the exact notation from Malvern, or the exact notation that we see from classical continuum mechanics. So when I write these two potatoes on my first day of course in continuum mechanics, I use this notation. But it's identical to what we're using in paradynamics, okay? It's just, in classical continuum mechanics, we've, we, we sort of leave off that there's this error term over there, that that deformation is just the leading term in the Taylor series. It's just a first order approximation. Not only that, that it assumes that these fields are smooth, because you have to take derivatives, right? In paradynamics, we're going to remove those restrictions, right? So we're going to take away, we're going, we're going to take away the smoothness restriction, and we're going to take away this, or we're going to leave the error, if you will. We're, you know, we're not we're not going to truncate it. We're going to use the exact displacements, whether they're continuous or not, and you know the, the reference coordinates. So this is the actual true deformation. This is that vector in the deformed configuration whether the displacements are smooth or not, and without any truncation error in the Taylor series. Right? This is the true deformation. So now I've just replaced my notation. Again, this y is a function of, and, and so we call this in paradynamics, we call this the deformation vector state. So uh, you know, it, it emanates from the point x, and it corresponds to the, to the reference vector xc. Okay? And so what we're saying is that the potential energy, the total potential energy in the body is a function of the de deformation everywhere in the body, right? Again, without any observation of experiments, without any knowledge, this is the only correct thing to do, right? So if we pass that variation over, something kind of strange shows up. If we, so if we, as, we, as we take this variation, something kind of strange shows up and that this, we get this second integral over xc, 
that, that sort of just appears here. And so I wanted to take a minute to talk about where that came from. This thing right here is the Fréché derivative of this function uh, xc, right? And so, uh, function psi, which is the, the total potential energy of the body, right? So, uh, as we, we, you know, so it's sort of a chain rule uh, on the variational operator. So you get this, this Fréché derivative uh, times the, the variation. But this, this integral that just shows up here kind of appears strange. And where it comes from is just the, from the property of the Fréché derivative. So the, the Fréché derivative of a function of a state, if it exists, is this thing. And I had some, some highlights, but they're not showing up. So it's, it's this thing. If it exists, it's this thing, right? And so if we just take this equation, If we just take this equation, replace delta y with a small parameter epsilon times the variation of y, this is just, we're just using a different notation here, we, and rearranging, we get this equation, and then with this equation, I'm going to divide by epsilon and take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and then you get this, right? So you see what, that's ex you know, exactly what I did. I divided by epsilon and took the limit as it goes to zero. You can see that this is this, this definition which we typically, you know, this is a Gateau derivative or the first variation of the function of xc. And you see on the left-hand side, here's this integral thing, right? So all I did was just manipulate the equation uh, in the definition of a Fréché derivative, and that's where that thing comes from, right? So that's where it comes from. Now we're just going to take y, and we're going to put in, plug in its definition, which was a function of the displacements at u, right? And so that's what we have here. So all I did was replace del y with its definition in terms of the displacements. So I have this guy, okay. Then I'm just going to split the integral, right? So I have this minus sign. So I just split the integral into two. And then I'm just going to use a trick where I basically repl I do uh, a, a, a sequence of change of variable operations followed by change of order of integration operations. A few years ago, uh, Professor Gunsberger and others uh, wrote a, um, a nice paper where they introduced this non-local vector calculus. So it's a compact notation uh, and, and allows a sort of a, a framework to do, to do functional analysis in terms of these non-local operators. And in that, they introduce uh, actual Green's identities. And it turns out this operation of the sequential changing the order of integration, uh, changing the, order, the, the dummy variable here followed by the change of order of integration, is what they call the first green identity or the non-local integration by parts. And so if we do that, uh, that's all, you know, then we get this equation. Now I'm just going to, now we have two, uh, you know, basically you see that this del u of x appears in both equations, so I can put them back together. And finally I end up with this thing right here. And then I just, uh, you know, use the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations, uh, evoking the arbitrariness of del u. And I'm left with this inner integral here, right here. So this inner integral uh, is what the, ver the, the verse variation of the function of the potential energy looks like. And again, because I made no approximation in the deformation field, this is the only thing you can get, right? Because it takes, you have to assume smoothness, you have to assume a first order deformation to get anything but this. Right? This is the only thing you can get following this de derivation. So then I just in introduced some shorthand notation that the Fréché derivative of this function is called T. We call that the force vector state. And there you see the paradynamic momentum equation. It's all its glory. Right? So I derived it from Hamilton's principle without any, having to, in, any notion of a non-local flux, anything like that, without any approximation in the kinematics. This is, if you don't approximate the kinematics in any way, this is the only equation you can get from Hamilton's principle. So, and, and you know, in all of that, you never saw me talk about a horizon. You know, basically, I said the, the the potential energy is a function at a point x is a function of the deformation everywhere in the body, right? So it's only now that I'll introduce a horizon, and I'll just say that, you know, sometimes it's useful or justified to assume that beyond some distance that this is zero. Okay. So it's only now that I introduce the horizon. In other words, the horizon could be infinite. Uh, it could be the entire body. So there's the paradynamic momentum equation. Now we're going to talk about 
constitutive models specifically, the, the actual forms of these force vector states and what they look like. And broadly, we classify them in paradynamics into two categories, what we call ordinary. So in ordinary, these force vector states act along the direction of the deformation vector state. And the nice thing about these models are is that we can prove that, you know, no matter, you know, no matter the form of T, as long as it's ordinary, it will, al it will always conserve angular momentum. This is, this is an analogy with the symmetry of the Cauchy stress in the classical theory. So these materials will always preserve, uh, you know, obey angular momentum. You can also have non-ordinary materials. So these, these materials are where these force vector states act in some direction other than the deformation vector state. And in, these, in this case, uh, angular momentum is not guaranteed but we can, you can still, it doesn't mean they won't conserve angular momentum, it's just not guaranteed in the way they are with an ordinary material. So I'll give you an example of both types. The linear paradynamic solid. So this model was introduced in uh, Stuart Silling's uh, 2007 paper where he introduced the concept of these vector states and other things. And so you can see that this is an ordinary material because uh, this, it turns out this is just a scalar, right? So this is just a number when you plug in everything, this is just a number, and this is a unit vector in the direction of the deformation vector state. So this has to be an ordinary material. Uh, and what, you know, if you see the form of this and you look at what these terms are, you see some analogy with the classical theory. So this is for an isotropic elastic material. This is a normal bulk modulus. This theta is a term that's representative of a dilatation, like a volume expansion of the material. So you have some bulk modulus times the volume expansion. There's some other scaling parameters there. Uh, and then over here on this side, this is the actual shear modulus, and this is in some notion of a deviatoric uh, a shearing uh, of the vector, of the original vector xc. So a lot of times, you'll in the literature in paradynamics, or when you hear people give a talk, people will say the word bond. I really don't like that word because it implies that these forces are springs, right? They're equal and opposite. And it gives you that notion. Uh, what, when I use, if, and sometimes it slips into my vocabulary, but if I say the word bond, I'm just talking about the vector xc, right? So it's just a way to identify the vector in the reference configuration. So anyway, um, yeah, so you have a volumetric term and a shear, shearing type term. So that you, you see some analogy with the classical theory. And I'll then just go ahead and you know, put in the details for what these are. Ultimately, they're all just, you know, when you plug in all these sort of intermediate variables, they're just in terms of the reference vectors and the deformed vectors, right? So the linear paradigmic solid is the most probably widely used. Uh, getting back to my point about the simpli simplicity in the constitutive models, the linear paradynamic solid is the most widely used uh, constitutive model in paradynamic simulations. But uh, just con considering the way that the parameters were derived, in other words, uh, wh where these sort of scaling comes from exactly, uh, one issue is that these are only valid, these sort of scaling parameters are only valid in the bulk of the material. So they were derived assuming that these integrals were for spherical horizons. Of course, that's not that's not a restriction of the theory. The, the, the horizon, this, this integral could be over the entire body, which could be completely irregular. It could be over some sub, subset of that, which could be completely irregular. But if you assume they're spherical, then you can, you, can, um, you can derive these scalings exactly such that the total elastic energy matches the strain energy from the classical theory. And so this was matched to a... To, uh, uh, you know, a, a Navier uh, type strain energy, and it has a flaw. So if you, if you consider the finite compression, which would be the scenario where you take the de deformed vector and you take it to zero, and because the kinematics are general enough, there's nothing to prevent you from doing this, right? You can take, you know, you can just, def just take your bond and push it to a point, right? If you do that and you evaluate those terms, so you get these elongation terms that look like this, and ultimately you get a force vector state that looks like this. Well, this is a constant. So you have, again, a scale, you have a constant times the bond, right? So it's a constant, right? times, you know, this is just a unit, this is just a unit vector. So this, you have a constant times the direction. So what this means in words is that if I, that it takes a finite force, right, a constant, a finite force, 
to produce an infinite deformation, right? So I can compress the material completely into a point with a finite force. Well, obviously, that's a flaw for real solid materials, right? By the way, you may not know this, but the classic linear elasticity has the same flaw. That's why we have to go to nonlinear finite deformation constitutive models, right? That's why you, have, that's why you see in, in Neo-Hookian models and other things, you see logarithms in there, right, to prevent this, this, this behavior. So a finite, you can compress, you know, the flaw here is you can compress the material to a point with, with a finite force. We don't like that. Give you an example of a non-ordinary material. So these are materials where the force vector states don't necessarily, are not necessarily in the direction of, of the deformed bond. This was presented, and I guess I missed a citation there, but this was presented also in Stewart's original aerodynamic state paper. And so what he does is he uses a movingly squared approximation of a deformation gradient. So we saw some talks on RKPM and other things. So this is a, this is a, if you look at what this is, this is a movingly squared, or in the, in the lingo of RKPM, this would be a continuous, right? So we're not using finite values, but this would be a continuous first order approximation, RKPM, reproducing kernel. I guess I can't say PM, right? Not, there's no particle method, but th this is a first order reproducing kernel approximation or a first order movingly squared approximation to the deformation gradient, right? And so if you do that, and then, then we're going to say, okay, what? Okay, well, you're, you're right. Yeah, okay, so I guess the proper thing to be, would be to, it's a, it's a first order reproducing kernel approximation to the deformation gradient. It, it is, I think. I think we showed that in the paper that we wrote. Well, it yeah. Depends on yeah. How you define the definitions. Yeah, I mean, this moment matrix is just the, the sort of lowest order moment. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, in the lingo of, of reproducing kernels, this would be a moment matrix. Right? So then what, we're do, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we have some strain energy, some paradynamic or non-local strain energy, and we're going to say that it's identically equal to the classical strain energy where the classical strain energy is a function of this approximated deformation gradient, okay? Again, it's approximated because it's just first order. Uh, so if we investigate a change in each of them, uh, we get a chain rule. You, sh you should be able to notice that this guy is just uh, your, your first piolo kirchhoff stress from the classical theory. So I'll go ahead and plug that in. I'll call this P. There, there we go. First order piolo kirchhoff stress. And now just using the definition of the Fréché derivative in terms of changes in the functions of states, then I, I get these terms, these integral terms. They, they appear just like I showed you earlier. Uh, and then you just sort of compare both sides. Again, this was supposed to be highlighted, but Basically, you can just read off the fact that T must equal P times the Fréché derivative of F. And so then what that looks like is this. So now we have a way to take a classical stress-strain constitutive model in terms, defined in terms of the first piolo kirchhoff stress, where we have our, this approximation of the deformation. Uh, K is, is the shape tensor, the, the moment matrix, right? So, uh, so this is... This is a way that we can basically take a classical constitutive model and turn it into a paradynamic force vector state, if you will. Okay. So now that seems useful, right? Because we have now we have this wealth of literature on classical constitutive models, plasticity models, and now we have a way to use them in paradynamics. But not so fast. <laughs> okay. One definition of stability would be that of a material model, would be to say that in static equilibrium, and, and just to make things simple, in the absence of body forces, we're going to require that the second variation of the potential energy must be at a minimum when it's in equilibrium. And so if you work through the details, you, you can see that in this scenario, this leads to a criterion where you have this sort of double integral again over xc and then x for the body, which when using these appro those approximations that I told you about, result in this, you know, any small change in the, in the stress times any small st strain uh, change in, in the deformation should always be positive, right? And so this is a criteria for stability uh, of this material model. And 
what you can see is all I have to do is imagine a scenario. If all I have to do is imagine a scenario where I have a deformation where I have just imagine two two bonds, right? Two bonds, and I pull on them on each side. I just pull on them. So I, I apply a small incremental deformation to one, and its mirror image on the other side. I apply this a small incremental deformation. Well, of course, the real deformation there is just two times whatever I pulled on it by, right? Two, two times this incremental deformation. However, if you evaluate that approximation, you, you know, as I showed it earlier, you get that f is equal to zero, right? And so, of course, then this is unstable. And so this is manifested as zero energy modes and other things in computations, but you don't even need to go to a computation. Uh, in the continuum, you can prove that this is going to be an unstable material model. So then there's a guy, a smart guy, works at Sandia now, Michael Tupac. He proposed something that he called generalized correspondence, right? So he defined the strain energy, uh, uh, a strain tensor, okay? And this tensor, uh, he parameterized by M in, in the spirit of a Seth Hill strain. So, uh, you know, so M shows up, there's a family of strain tensors, if you will, and it shows up, this M is just a parameter here. And so, <clears throat> Depending on your choice of M, you get different strain. You get d analogies with different strains, like the Hinky strain, uh, Lagrangian strain, whatever. Okay, and so he proposed this, and he called it a generalized. Uh, he called it extended constitutive correspondence model because uh, it's it's correspondence in the sense that you're matching strain energy density functionals. You use a strain tensor, therefore you can derive a stress tensor. And he also, I'm not going to show the details, but he shows the, the, the development from that stress tensor into this, you know, the translation, if you will, from that stress tensor uh, defined by this strain tensor into the force vector state that you use in paradynamics. And he shows all the proofs that this is a stable material model and it, work, it seems to work and it seems to be good because now we, you know, now we have what we want, if you will. We have something useful in the sense that we can use a classical strain, you know, we have a measure of strain and we can use it in, uh, with, a, with a corresponding, you know, work conjugate stress. And then we can have, uh, develop uh, these force vector states and use them in paradynamic materials. It's just, it's sort of uh, a little bit unsatisfying because when he derived this, uh, these strange parameters, they just, you know, it's just sort of strange coefficients just show up here. He doesn't give any expl He didn't derive it. He actually just proposed it and, it, and it seems to work. He shows that it works. He shows that for any value of m with these coefficients, then you, and it leads to the classical local stress, strain. What's up? So uh, is this saying you're using the classical Cauchy formula? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just change my definitions. So basically, you you are not using Cauchy; you are doing an extension of Cauchy approximation. That's the way I interpret this. It might just call it a it's a measure of non-local strain, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But the whole idea would it, be basically Cauchy. Turn, and it, using a classical yeah. definition of yeah. Cauchy formulation, oh. no. which is not well posed. So you need to define something yeah. else. And uh, yeah, okay. I mean, it's just a this is a non-local strain, and there, there's still no dependence on the gradients of displacements or anything. We're just using the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this actually works, but the shortcoming is, or the, the unsatisfying part is, well, where do these weird coefficients come from? Well, that's 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 another. We, that's a whole, a whole other talk, <laughs> okay. But um, the other thing is, that, well, it turns out these coefficients were derived in a way that this is only valid in the bulk of the material. So again, assuming a spherical horizon in the bulk of the material. And so the shortcoming there is along the boundaries, or if you have some irregularly shaped horizon, you end up with a softened material, a sort of artificially softened material model, right? Whereas the previous correspondence model, the one that Stewart derived with the deformation gradient, you had this moment matrix that seemed to take care of any irregularities in the, in the, you know, in the, in the kernel, right? This doesn't have that, okay. So, 
Again, uh, this, you know, it has all the other things we like. You know, if I take, if for any value of m less than or equal to zero, if I take this to zero, it leads to this going to infinity, so minus infinity. So then any quadratic strain energy density functional would go to infinity or blow up. And it has the correct behavior in the sense that it'll, it, it, it penalizes these deformations and it won't allow, it won't allow you to have a, a, an infinite deformation with a finite force. Right? So that, that's another thing we like about it. So this is the new stuff, if you will, right? So uh, the, the other dissatisfying thing about just presenting the strain tensor without the other kinematics is that there's no notion of, uh, say, pullback or push forward operations. So I'm not sure how we do plasticity. Because we, we need finite deformation plasticity, we need a pullback or push forward operation into some, say, intermediate, un, you know, unstressed configuration. This is all sort of just follows classical sort of SEMO finite deformation plasticity. And without any notion of the kinematics, would, would, if you just give me a strain tensor and you don't, you don't tell me any, any of the intermediate deformations, I can't push forward or pull back, right? So, this is the new stuff. Um, what we propose is something that, that we'll call, and again, the M uh, uh, will be apparent in a second, but a family of generalized right Cauchy green deformation tensors, or paradynamic generalized right Cauchy green deformation tensors. Again, there's no dependence upon uh, you know, the smoothness of the field or anything. In fact, if you look, this is just the absolute value of the deformation. So this is the, you know, just the change in length of the bond, if you will, uh, and then some things in the reference coordinates, and then this L is the inverse of this sort of fourth order moment matrix, if you will, right? And now with this thing, we can prove that with M equals one, this is, you know, and for, for uniform deformations that are, you know, these are the, the classical deformations where the deformation state is just F exceed without an error, right? So in this case, the deformation state is exactly the classical deformation, and we can prove then that this uh, right Cauchy, you know, generalized right Cauchy Green deformation tensor is exactly the, the right Cauchy Green deformation tensor, F transpose F. Right. Then we can define a, a new you know, family of, of non local strains, uh, strain measures using this guy. The key thing to remember is that you know, in the classical th sort of Seth Hill strain, this is C, the tensor C raised to the M power, or the 2M power, okay? This is not what's happening here. This is not a tensor C raised to the 2M power. So it's important to keep in mind that that's not, the, the penalization uh, appears, you know, here. So that, you know, in this case, it's a 1, but there's a 2M right there. So it appears on the change in length of the bond, right? So now we have this family of, Strain measures, we can prove, you know, for, for M equals one, you get exactly, in, in uniform deformations, you get exactly the Green-Lagrange strain. For, for M equals zero, you get exactly the Hinky strain. Uh, for any value of M in the linearization, uh, you get the classic linear strain, okay? Uh, in the bulk of the material, we, and we can actually uh, solve for what the, we can analytically evaluate the integrals and spherical coordinates for that uh, fourth order moment matrix and it evaluates to this where this is just some scalar constant uh, we call it a weighted volume so we can evaluate it in closed form and it turns out then we can in, we can invert this right so we can invert this guy in closed form and if we invert it in closed form we get this right and if I plug that back into Right, remember, so C, remember, C has L here, right? So now, in the bulk of the material, I've solved for L analytically, right? So L inverse is this, L is this, I've inverted that guy, and I plug it back into my definition for E, and it looks different, but lo and behold, this is 2 pex E, right? There's that, five, that strange 5 halves, there's a 1 half there. This is identically equal to his strain measure, Again, only in the bulk of the material where I can do this inversion analytically. Around the boundaries, I have to invert this guy numerically, right? Because, or, you know, in general, for any irregular boundary, I'm going to have to invert this thing numerically. Uh, but that's going to give me the correction. I'm not going to have softened the material parameters around boundaries. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to have all the sort of correct constitutive behavior. So um, then I can define with that, I say the, save the details, uh, but with M equals 1, th that is a scenario where the strain is exactly the green Lagrange strain for uniform deformations. I can show that the force vector state ends up looking like this, where this S is the second piola kirchhoff stress, so the symmetric stress. And the interesting thing about this, this is what we would traditionally call a correspondence model, in the sense that we're corresponding strain energies, but far different from Selling's original model, which was non-ordinary, this is ordinary, because you have uh, a second order tensor, a second order tensor, a fourth order tensor, so this is fourth order tensor contracted with a fourth order tensor, this whole thing contracts to a scalar, and then you just multiply by the bond length. So it's definitely in the direction of the bond. It's an ordinary material. Right? So there has been some, if you're familiar with paradynamics literature, there's some confusion that anytime you use these, that these sort of non-ordinary materials imply correspondence models or vice versa, but this is not true. Uh, so now we, we formed a stress tensor in the classical way and we have an ordinary material. Now I can use this and solve it in the paradynamic momentum equation. I have some notion of uh, C, I also, I'm going to skip this quickly, but I also have a left Cauchy Green deformation tensor. I can prove that it's exactly the left Cauchy Green deformation tensor. Uh, I can uh, define Eulerian strain measures. Um, and, and so now with sort of a notion of this finger tensor and the right Cauchy Green te deformation tensor, now I can, I have some kinematics there that I can do push forward, pull back operations. And that's going to show, be apparent in a, in a moment. So now we're kind of changing directions in the talk a little bit, but, but it turns out I needed all that. So I needed this notion of push forward and pull back. I needed that constitutive theory that I just showed you in order to do this stuff. Right? So uh, there was a little bit of talk about mixture theory yesterday, but basically if we have a... Uh, first contact miscible mixture of alpha species, then the total density is the sum of the densities. So these are the sort of local densities. That's the, the volume, uh, um, you know, the, the mass of the alpha species divided by the volume of the alpha species. Or you can say these, these sort of, uh, you can define these densities rho bar, which are the volume of the alpha species divided by the volume of the mixture multiplied by phi, which is a volume fraction. And so then you also have this concept of a volume fraction constraint, that is that, you know, the, all the fees must add up to one, right? And so this was covered a little bit, a little bit yesterday. Um, in, in the classical theory, we have this material form of conservation of mass, right, that says that, you know, the, 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 dens the sum of the density over the whole body in the reference configuration must equal some of the, the sum of the density in the, in the deformed configuration. And then we can uh, basically pull back to the reference configuration through the Jacobian, um, uh, the Jacobian, uh, the, you know, the determinant of the deformation gradient here, and then you get this this relationship between uh, the, the uh, Jacobian determinant and the densities from the conservation of mass equation. The problem is in paradynamics, I don't have a J because I don't have an F because F might be undefined because F is defined as the gradient of u plus i. And I didn't assume that the deformation was smooth. So I don't have a gradient of u. Therefore, I don't have an f. Therefore, I can't do this pullback, right? But I can always do a change of coordinates. If I'm doing an integral over a volume, I can always do a change of coordinates if I know what the scaling is between the reference and the deformed coordinates, right? So, I mean, you know, in words, what j is is the scaling of the volume between the reference and the deformed, right? So if I can figure out what the scaling is between the reference and the deformed, I can still use this, this concept, and therefore I need some concept of a paradynamic J, if you will, right? So this is the volume scaling between the reference and the, and the, and the, and the deformed coordinates. Um, turns out, you know, so I, I, I showed you the left and right Cauchy Green deformation tensors, and we know in the classical theory that j squared is just the determinant of those guys. And, you know, the j squared is equal to the determinant of c is equal to the determinant of b. And that's also true for those that I showed earlier for uniform deformations. Right? But I can't prove that it's always true. Okay? So I'm not going to just use that. 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use, I mean, this is a nasty thing, but this is a scalar triple product of all the possible vectors in the deformed configuration, squared, divided by the scalar triple product, right, of all the possible vectors in the reference configuration, squared. So physically, this is the volume of the deformed configuration, squared, divided by the volume of the reference configuration squared. So it's J squared. Okay? The, the physically, that is the volume scaling. And I'll spare you the details, but who wants to evaluate these nasty triple integrals? But it turns out we can show, it's not that hard to show, that, it, that evaluating this thing right here is identical to evaluating that. And so now we have this tensor, and it turns out that the determinant of this tensor field is J squared. And again, we have the analytic proof that shows that this is always true, right? So now we have, with this paradynamic J matrix, we take the determinant of it, we have some J squared that's always valid for any deformation, right? So this is the volume scale in between the reference and the form. It's the same in the case where the deformation is F XC uniform, right? The deformation gradient times the XC. In that case, I can prove that they're all equal to one another. It's in, it's in cases where the deformation is inhomogeneous that I can't prove that the classical ones are equal to J squared. All right, so now um, we're going to use Hamilton's extended principle where basically the first three terms are identical from before and we're going to add in this constraint. So a lot of times, you know, this, you might say this is Gauss's least action principle. So now we have the sort of normal energy constrained by some kinematic motion. Uh, the two constraint equations we're going to use are the material form of the conservation of mass, right? So we have material form of conservation of mass penalized by a Lagrange multiplier, and this Lagrange multiplier is, defor is defined in the reference configuration. So if we take the variation of this, it looks ugly, and we have these sort of Frechet derivatives of J, but remember, J is just the term of that tensor. It's ugly, but these can be done relatively straightforward. You know, you get long equations, but so this is what the variation of that first constraint looks like. We have an additional constraint that is the volume fraction constraint, and this is where things get strange. Because the volume fraction constraint is imposed in the current configuration. That is, in the current configuration, the sum of all the, you know, the, the, the sum of all the intrinsic densities times the volume fractions must equal to one, right? So the volume, you know, the, all of the, the volume fraction of the material must equal to one in the current configuration. And so this Lagrange multiplier is imposed in the current configuration. And this is where things get strange because so far in all of the paradynamic literature, everything is with respect to the reference configuration. And so we have to, this is where we have to do a pullback. And I, was, I figured I was fatiguing you guys with equations because I was a fatiguing myself at this point when I was preparing this talk. But, you know, basically, uh, we have a pullback operation that's apparent in this, in this B inverse that you see over here. So this is the left Cauchy Green deformation tensor. And so what this is, this is a, uh, so when you take this, this variations unit up with a Frechet derivative with respect to the current coordinates, which we haven't really defined yet. And so in order to actually take that guy, we have to, we have to do this pullback operation. And we, we show that this is equal to this. And, and I'll spare you the details, but you know, it turns out I can show analytically that this is equal to the classical uh, gradient with respect to the current coordinates of the, of the volume fraction. Okay, and so I, again, at this point, I just, was, <laughs> I was fatigued, and I figured you guys would be too, so I'm just going to say that uh, basically we have all the ingredients for a mixture theory now, right? So with Hamilton's principle, uh, just defining the potential energy in terms of any number of alpha species, uh, with these constraint equations, the, the conservation of mass equation, uh, and there we have, you know, all the variations in terms of how you do it in paradynamics, along with uh, the volume fraction constraint. We have all the ingredients we need to have a general sort of alpha species mixture theory. Uh, however, if we specialize the two species, so if we just say that alpha is a solid and a fluid, and we assume that the strain and energy density functions are functions of this now non-local tensor E, Legrain, the non-local green Lagrange strain, and the, the intrinsic density of the solid, uh, and the fluid strain and energy density functional is a function of its intrinsic density of the fluid. 
and we just work through the machinery of Hamilton's principle. I'm not going to, I'll spare you all the details, but if you just work through the details, we can show that this non-local finite deformation theory corresponds to, to a classical finite deformation theory for poor mechanics. And then if I linearize that, I get B, the BO equations for poor elasticity. So in the, in the, my non-local theory in the local limit corresponds to the finite deformation theory in the local theory. And then if I linearize that finite deformation theory, I get BO theory, which is well accepted that that's how you do poral mechanics, right? And so apparently we, we have a, a theory for finite deformation, poral mechanics, non-local finite deformation, poral mechanics that is in agreement with the classical theory. I say details forthcoming because we're submitting the manuscript on all this, but it's, it shows all the details for those derivations. So in summary, I presented a review of paradynamic kinematics and constitutive modeling. I hope that was useful to present, you know, the, the derivation of the paradynamic momentum equation. That you see, it's very straightforward if you just don't make any approximations about the kinematics. It doesn't. It's not a mystery of where it comes from. Uh, so hopefully that was useful. Uh, I showed you this new finite deformation constitutive modeling theory that we've developed, and and presented a, a mixture theory framework based on extended Hamilton's principle and. And, uh, you know, I, I spared the details, but again, that course for, for poral mechanics, for a solid and a fluid, it, we can show that it corresponds exactly to BO theory. So I'll end there. I've never given a talk with that many equations in it before. <laughs> <And>, uh, <laughs>